Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gloria Blackwell, AAUW's Executive Vice President and Chief Program Officer, and welcome to today's webinar in conversation with Dr. Rajika Bandari, America Calling, a Foreign Student in a Country of Possibility. Welcome to our conversation. So let's get started. I'm very, very pleased to introduce AUW Fellowships alumna, Dr. Rajika Bandari. She's an international higher education expert, a published author of five academic books and one work of nonfiction, and a sought after public speaker. She has lived firsthand the experiences she studies and writes about. She came to the U.S. as an international student from India in 1992 to pursue a PhD in psychology at North Carolina State University that was partially funded by an AAUW International Fellowship. And she obtained her bachelor's degree in psychology at the University of Delhi in India. With a career in education that spans over 25 years, she's held senior leadership roles in the private, academic, and nonprofit sectors. Most recently, she served as the president and CEO of the IC3 Institute and spent over a decade at the Institute of International Education, where she led IIE's research, impact, and thought leadership activities, including the flagship Open Doors Report on International Education Exchange. Dr. Bhandari shares her personal education and immigration experience in her newly published memoir, America Calling, a foreign student in a country of possibility, which speaks to the experiences of millions of international students who navigate the complex education to immigration system in America and the expectations of cultural assimilation. Welcome, Rajika. Thank you so much, Gloria. I'm delighted and so very honored to, to be here today. Thank you. So let's get started. Of course, my first question is, what motivated you to write your book and why at this time? So I'd started thinking about the book um, some years ago, and it had really come out of um, having become a professional studying international student issues. So, so looking at these issues from the perspective of a professional, of a researcher, but at the same time, reflecting on what the, what the personal experience uh, felt like, because I had been through that pathway and that journey myself. And now I was sort of on the other side of the fence as a subjective researcher studying these issues. And through all of it, there was this realization that outside of my immediate sector of international education, amongst the common public in the US, there's actually not much known about international students, um, not much known about their histories, their stories, or even the value that they bring to the US. So I've begun thinking about some of these issues already, wanting to tell that story in a more narrative form. And then things changed politically in the US about four or five years ago. And um, the entire climate for um, international students, for immigrants at large, at large really shifted. And at that point, I began to feel a real imperative to tell the story, to bring it to fruition even sooner. Um, again, because the environment um, surrounding, um, I would say, anybody who kind of represented the quote unquote outsider in the US had really shifted. And so that's when it became, um, I felt I could no longer be on the sidelines watching this happen, both as someone who'd, who'd, um, who'd uh, been through that journey, but also as someone who was an expert in studying it, that I, I, I needed to tell the story and tell it as soon as I could. Great. Thank you. That, that, that's really, really important. And as I mentioned in the intro, you know, the book really, it, it, it speaks so strongly about the education to immigration process that so many international students go through, right? Uh, and while they're planning their future beyond academics. Um, and, and why was it so important for you to speak to this process? So in the book, I refer to the journey as a broken pathway 
between education and immigration. And the reason is that when you look at the American success story post 1960s, and I say post 1960s because it was the time of uh, the civil rights movement and um, a new immigration policy uh, uh, being released, which once again opened the doors of the US to sort of the best and brightest from around the world, and which is when an influx of international students from around the world once again came to the US, particularly from Asia. So if we look at the current success story that is America, and we look at who's part of that story, immigrants make up a large part of it, whether, and you know, some of the examples are very common, you know, Nobel Prize winners, um, Silicon Valley founders, professors um, at American universities. More recently, um, many of the inventors and founders who've been on the front lines of, found, of, um, of, um, of the pandemic, for example, the co-founder of Moderna, Nuba Rafian, came to the US as an international student. So there are so many examples examples like that, yet when we look at our policies, they don't reflect that undeniable link between that pathway of education to immigration and recognizing that many students who come to the US are going to want to stay on, are going to want to pursue those opportunities and become valuable members of American society, just as there are many who go back to their home countries and still continue their connection with the US. So that link is really critical, even when we look at it statistically on how many students actually stay on and become part of the fabric of, uh, of immigrant America. Yet, not only do we have policies that address that, but also I found, as someone who'd again travel that pathway myself, that that story has never been fully told. Um, again, for the, for, for the common reading public on what does that journey look like? Because there's often that assumption um, that, oh, if you're a successful immigrant and you have a master's or perhaps a PhD from an elite institution, um, that you've achieved the American dream. But that understanding of how hard that pathway is from coming as a student, and if you're someone who chooses to stay on, then what does that difficult journey look like was not actually written about um, a great deal. Yeah, that, that's very true. And you you mentioned the American dream uh, a few times. So well, talk a little bit about your definition of the American dream and how it's connected to education. So that's a great question on sort of what is my definition, because I think it, it alludes to the fact that there is no one definition of the American dream. I think there's so many different shades to it, but I think what is common to all of those definitions is this idea of aspiration and hard work and that the US is a country where um, if you give it your all, you work hard, you are going to achieve certain successes, however those successes may be, may be defined. So I think to me, that's what always symbolized the American dream. And again, that specific pathway may look different for different people. But also I think um, you rightly said that education is really, really central to it. So again, if we look at, um, and you know, here maybe I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, uh, you know, casting a wide net and including um, many different immigrants. But if you look across, again, Immigrant America, that idea of, regardless of where you've come from, of um, recognizing the value of education and that if you educate yourself and work your, the way, your way up that ladder of education, that's an asset that nobody can ever take away from you. Someone can take away your job, you can lose your job, um, a lot can happen, but you can't lose your education. So I think that link of um, education to achieving the American dream is really seen quite consistently across, um, across many immigrant cultures in the US. Okay. Education is also something that we talk about as a pathway to women's empowerment, right? And, you know, personal transformation. 
uh, your your story is quite interesting because of the the, the personal way that you approached your own um, sort of cultural traditions. Uh, can you talk a bit about how you ignored so many of the patriarchal traditions in your society and you know have you know, transformed yourself into a global higher education uh, expert while being a single mother? Yeah, so this is a thread that runs through my book, um, Gloria, as you probably picked up on, that it's also um, very much of a coming of age story. And um, for me, leaving home and coming to the US was um, a much more complete education than I had ever anticipated. And what I mean by that, it, it was not just about academics or learning about a new culture, but it was also um, beginning to understand myself as a woman, beginning to understand gender dynamics and uh, patriarchy in other countries in the world, including the one I originally came from, but also beginning to see how some of those patterns are also present in the US, so which came as a, as a surprise to me. So, um, so I think that the that experience of leaving home and the way I characterize it is that that it allows you to not only learn about where you're headed and your destination, but it also teaches you a lot about where you're coming from. So while I myself was fortunate to grow up in a fairly progressive family, my parents were very progressive. I was still being raised in a culture that was largely traditional and patriarchal. But once I was out of that out of that setting, and again, living in the US, it allowed me to reflect on some of the things that I had assumed for myself, that my society or culture had, had assumed of me, certain things that, that or certain pathway I, I thought that my life would take. But reality proved to be otherwise. And um, along the way, I began to question um, a lot of the beliefs that surrounded me, whether it was around um, things like marriage, whether it was around how do women make choices about their careers vis-a-vis -vis their relationships, et cetera. And you're right, Gloria, that, you know, I mean, there, there are many such examples uh, in my life, but uh, it's, uh, it also brought me to a juncture. And you mentioned it that, yes, I also chose to become a single mom, which uh, in my, <laughs> I would say in my country and community and culture is almost, uh, is almost almost unheard of. So yes, um, it's been a process of really, um, really questioning a lot of the boundaries that 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 I had, um, or that had surrounded me or that I'd assumed um, growing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and obviously, that is bucking, bucking the system and going against tradition is definitely something that I, I'm sure was an incredible challenge and you know you had to draw upon a, a great deal of resiliency in order you know to be the mother and also the professional that you needed to be um, and, and it makes me think about you know a conversation that we've been having here you know in, in our own country uh, and I'm thinking about women and and role models and being resilient um, do you have any thoughts around the election of, you know, the United States first Indian and, and black female vice president? Uh, because her mother came to the U.S. as an international student from India. And, you know, what, what does that mean for Indian women following along a similar path? So first off, I'll just say it's meant a lot for women. Regardless, it's meant a lot for women. It's meant a lot for young girls to be able to see themselves, to, to be able to aspire to a certain role and to be um, leading the country. So I think it's meant a lot for women, um, women every, uh, for all women in the US. But more specifically, it's um, really allowed, I think the South Asian community in the US and of course women in particular, to finally see their group represented at the very highest levels of power, because uh, we might not realize it, but actually um, 
Indian Americans are one of the fastest growing uh, minority groups in the US. And I'm really happy to say that it's only in recent years that we've seen much larger political participation and political representation um, by the group. So to see that reflected in Kamala Harris has been um, really critical and a form of validation and recognition within um, US society. I also think that it has um, catapulted who international students are in that pathway again into the public eye in a way that it had not earlier. And not only were both her parents uh, international students, as you mentioned, her mother from India, her father from Jamaica, but also Barack Obama's father was an international student from Kenya. So again, if we look at two of the most important recent, current and recent leaders in the US, there is there has been that history of uh, educational diplomacy of uh, that pathway of both education and immigration in, um, in both of their families. Great, that, that, that's really, really, really important. Um, and I know that people will have uh, some question about the fact that, uh, first of all, that you were uh, an AAUW International Fellow. So I first wanted to note that, you know, as an organization, we certainly uh, encourage our fellows to make contributions to their to their home countries. And so um, you can do that, obviously, uh, anywhere in the world. But the majority of our recipients do remain in their in their home country. So I just want folks to know that we're not advocating for uh, our fellows to uh, change to try and change their immigration status. But you were awarded an AEW fellow, and uh, we're, we're very proud of that. I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about how that fellowship impacted your, um, your research and your studies at that time. So the fellowship was um, came at a really instrumental time for me for two reasons. Um, first was the very practical reason. Um, uh, contrary to what some might think, and that's one of the myths that my book tries to dispel, um, international students, um, um, or let me put it another way. It's not easy for international students to survive fin financially in the US. It's always a struggle. So I will just say more broadly that scholarships are so very important. So what organizations like AAUW do, many others do, is so critical, especially for students who are coming from the global south um, or from developing countries. Um, so having said that, it came it came at a really critical point for me, um, if first in just providing that support for me to be able to persist and continue my education, but also because I was increasingly becoming interested in women's education issues within the international development context. And um, receiving the fellowship allowed me to um, pursue an agenda of research in that area where for the next several years, including for my doctoral work, um, I did a great deal of research on um, women and um, education as a level for development, again, in the global south, specifically focusing on Asia. So I went back and did field work in India. My doctoral work was in China, and it really enabled me to un ultimately understand understand how critical educating girls and women, and to show that through my research, how critical educating girls and women is, um, is for many countries. And um, I think these issues have really come to the fore again more recently also because of what we're seeing in current developments in, in Afghanistan and, um, and in other parts of the world. So I would say that that's, those are the two ways in which the fellowship was really critical at that point in time. And I can certainly let you know that there are a number of AAUW members on the call for this webinar. And, you know, it was certainly thanks to their generous contributions over the years that we have been able to continue to offer fellowships to uh, deserving women like yourself. Um, and we will continue to do so well into the future because of the, the generosity and the commitment to AAUW members and AAUW as an organization.
Uh, and speaking of AAUW, uh, this November, we're going to be celebrate, celebrating 140 years as an organization. Uh, we can talk a bit about how the fellowship was important at the time of your studies. Can you share a little bit about how uh, AAUW has was able to impact your getting to the career that you um, had over the years? So I think it was um, to, to sort of build off of uh, the previous um, question, I think it, 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 the, the, mom, the time that I received the fellowship really enabled me to make a foray into thinking about women and education issues in a global context. And over the time of my career, even if my immediate role at different phases was not exactly focused on that, it was an area of interest that I never forgot. And I kept coming back to it at different points in my career. So even at um, the Institute of International Education, which of course, Gloria, you're, you're very familiar with in all my years, um, of being there, and uh, the team that I used to lead knows this, that in, even though gender was not, was not the sole focus of the work that we did, whether it was leading the Open Doors report uh, on international educational exchange or other evaluations and impact studies of fellowship and scholarship programs, I would always bring the gender lens to bear on that, that what are we seeing with women? Because we know that impact, how, how initiatives and programs um, impact women, how they engage women can be very different from how they impact men. And it's, so it's very important to not forget that variation and to, to, to look at some of those outcomes with the gender lens. So I really helped sort of bring that perspective into um, some of the areas that we were looking at, always asking that question, that, um, for example, when we're looking at the outreach of scholarship and fellowship programs, are there elements to those programs that are making it difficult for women to even apply in the first place? Um, are they reaching working mothers? Are they reaching other populations of, um, of women? So, um, so I think those, those are the ways in which it had a long lasting impact. Um, through that work, I went on to author a number of research pieces uh, that again looked at uh, women in the space of uh, international higher education or within international fellowship and scholarship programs and attempting to document um, how they were being served through these initiatives and what some of the impacts were. That gender lens is so important. And, you know, for, for many, many years, it was overlooked. So I definitely applaud you for ensuring that, you know, the consideration of the unique needs of women uh, played a role in, in the research that you were doing, because then that ultimately has an impact on organizations, you know, who are looking at uh, funding foreign students and, you know, the essence of, of being fair, but also taking into account, you know, the unique circumstances of women, for sure. Um, and so while you were a, a student in the U.S., um, what do you think was your, the greatest obstacle that you had to overcome? And, you know, what was essential in helping you to overcome it? I would say my greatest obstacle was that no one had prepared me for the dramatically different classroom and academic culture of the US. And it wasn't about language because I was perfectly fluent in English. Um, I was coming from a large city, Delhi, so it was none of, none of those issues. But the whole philosophy of teaching and learning in the US and in many Western nations is so different from I would sort of general, I know I'm generalizing here, but so different from what many Asian students are exposed to. So I was not used to a setting where I would be required to speak all the time, where I would be expected to 
air my views and critique information um, where I would be expected to question my professor and not just expect it, but I would actually be assessed on some of those things because they're considered an essential element of critical thinking and classroom engagement, particularly at the graduate level. And it wasn't that I was stupid or that I didn't have ideas, but that I had been raised in a culture where it's the opposite, that you don't ask those questions and the professor is very much the sage on the stage and the expert and you do not question their authority. So I would say, and there's sort of many other examples like that, but um, the classroom culture is what I was quite un unequipped to deal with in terms of what was my greatest support system then. I think it was quietly observing my American classmates and how they were handling all of this with great aplomb and ease. Um, and just learning by observation. Um, and um, I think that, that, things, that things have changed now, certainly. But there are some enduring challenges as well. But I would say those those were some of that was sort of my biggest biggest challenge. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I'm assuming that over the during that experience, there were certainly hills and valleys, and you utilized many many strategies uh, in order to in order to uh, overcome them. Uh, and, and I'm wondering, given your experience in international education as well. Uh, how has the international student experience evolved in the last 20 years, uh, you know, from when, you know, you were first engaged and, and sort of what the landscape looks like now? That's a really important question. So first off, I'll say that I, I think the what I call sort of the face of the international student has changed quite significantly. And what I mean by that is, um, that who has come to the U.S. in large numbers has really shifted over, over years, depending on which countries have been able to afford to send their students, or where has the middle class, class grown significantly, and that's been sort of the story behind the big boom from China in recent years and Chinese undergraduates, et cetera. So I think that has shifted and morphed over time. What has certainly evolved um, is has also been, so you know, we just talked about sort of my challenges in the classroom. So I think that there's certainly been an evolution in how institutions um, are supporting their students and, and an evolution in the sorts of resources and infrastructure that American colleges and universities have built up to support international students, but also a real growth around the world and, for example, Education USA advising centers and other groups that are helping uh, prepare students. However, the big caveat to this, and this was one of the very interesting findings for me in the book, was and I've, and I've interviewed several um, current and recent students uh, for the book as well. And this is sort of the big, the big thing, that there are areas that to my great surprise have persisted, some of the challenges that have persisted over time and that I experienced 20 years ago, which still exists. So again, I think we have not fully dealt with those deeper cultural, academic cultural issues, which would enable students to succeed more. There are incredible challenges that continue to exist around the immigration hurdles and challenges that international students face, not just if they decide to immigrate, but within that bucket are all the regulations and everything that they have to adhere to while they're still a student. Um, and I think the third piece that's persisted is that I felt when I came to the US, I did not have a very good and nuanced un understanding of American society. And that I was not just arriving at a particular campus, but I was arriving to live in a new society for whatever period of, you know, undefined period of time. And I think that despite all our technological advances and despite the fact that everybody of my generation in India has now seen Friends and every other American show, there is still not a really solid understanding of, of um, American history, of 
the, the fabric of American life, of diversity in America. And I think that really came to the fore last year with the Black Lives Matter movement and the resurgence of the social justice movement in the US, where for the first time, international students were, were seeing a side of the US, but also having to confront their own lack of understanding and knowledge for, for the first time. Yeah, that, that's a very that's a very powerful point, and and seeing how international students joined in and you know became advocates themselves for racial justice was really important as well. When you think about your story as a whole, and you think about your motivation for uh, writing a book and you know putting it down on paper, as we used to say, what do you want readers to take away from your story? more universal message, I mean, because this is not just about international education or being an international student, but I think the more universal message is um, that that experience of education, um, whether it's global or not, is so important because it pushes us outside our comfort zone and it mm. really enables us to become the, the individuals that we're meant to be. But the other point I'd like to make is, um, or the message I'd like to leave people with is recognizing how important um, American universities and colleges have been as a way to connect people in this country with people from around the world, and that there has been no better form of um, citizen diplomacy or soft diplomacy that, than people learning within this education system and some staying on like I did, but others going back to their countries where they've really helped form a bridge um, bridge with the US. And something that's really important, especially given um, the whole move we're seeing globally, not just in the US, but in other countries also towards becoming more insular and more nationalistic. So th those would sort of be my two, two thoughts on that. Yeah. And when you mention uh, citizen uh, diplomacy, you know, it reminds me of the other the other important piece of of U.S. citizen diplomacy, which is I, I'm, a, I'm I was a Peace Corps volunteer. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, the reverse is how we send, you know, Americans abroad, you know, to ensure that Americans are getting you know, an experience around the rest of the world. So when foreign students come here or when we go abroad, then we have that opportunity to learn about each other's and appreciate each other's cultures for sure. Absolutely. And I'll just say that, and Gloria, you've read the book, that that's sort of the other half of the argument that I make, that mm -hmm. it's not just about um, international students coming to the that's U.S., right. but how important it remains for American students to continue to um, to, to go abroad. So, yeah, thank Absolutely. you for mentioning that. Absolutely. And to learn a foreign language. That's important as well, even though we understand that so many places around the world, you know, you can speak English. It's also important that we continue to focus uh, also on second language learning uh, opportunities for Americans as well. Um, so I'm wondering if there are any policy recommendations that you think might be important to ensure that international students, uh, you know, might, might really get their their shot at uh, what, what your um, terms, terms around the American dream are? Uh, what might need to happen? So I think there are two specific changes. Um, one is around the time when international students are sort of getting ready to embark on their journey. And um, currently, the visa that brings international students to the US, the F1, uh, F1 visa, is what's called a single intent visa, which means that an international student has to promise that they do not intend to immigrate to the US. Now that's, uh, in many cases, a really young person, and if it's an undergraduate, undergrad, they're only, I don't know, 17 mm -hmm. or 18, in my case, I was a little bit older, are being asked to make decisions about their future in a way where they do not even have complete information on how, how are their aspirations or how are their plans going to evolve. 
So I think that's one that, and this is true in, uh, I mean, many other countries don't require this, but I think that um, allowing that to be a dual intent, or at least not a single intent visa, makes that acknowledgement of that pathway much clearer that, you know, some will choose to return, as many have, but some may choose to pursue that path to immigration and that that might be okay. Um, the second part of it is um, really the, the hurdles that are currently presented in the path of people who are um, wanting to follow that pathway to becoming an immigrant and where the reality is that the U.S. is losing global talent. It's used, losing talent that was trained in the U.S. in American universities. And those are also some of the cases that I document in the book. But that if you look at, um, and I'll, uh, I love statistics, so I'll cite a couple, but the K2 Institute just last year estimated in 2020 that there was still, as of last year, 1.2 million individuals who were still waiting for green cards, again, through this particular pathway of skilled immigration, and that for an average Indian waiting for that green card, again, because there are quotas around that, et cetera, um, the wait could be 90 years, nine zero years, which means that some could actually even age out and die by this projection while they're waiting for a green card. So that's that's how backlogged the system is. And um, it will be a loss for the U.S. because other competing countries, and you know the obvious one people think of is Canada, but there's Australia and the U.K., um, how are, uh, you know, um, have different policies and um, have implemented friendlier policies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, you know, I think that obviously the U.S. immigration and policy system is incredibly complex. And, you know, we're, we're clearly not advocating um, one policy over another. But I think it's also important that, you know, people people learn about how the complexities of it and how, you know, it's not one dimensional. And there's certainly challenges that abound when we think about, you know, whether it's education or whether it's a business visa or whether people are, are coming for humanitarian reasons that, you know, the U.S. is struggling uh, with its immigration policy uh, across the board. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. Um, so as, a, as an Asian woman who studied in the U.S., you know, at the doctoral level, do you have any specific recommendations or, or items that you'd like to share with, um, uh, especially to Asian women doctoral students or just in general? So this is an interesting one, and I, uh, I, I talk about this in the book where I really call it um, sort of the, and, and you know, in recent years, this has almost become a bit of a buzzword, but it's really the intersectionality of the experience where the way I characterize it is you're foreign, you're female, and you look different. Mm -hmm. And so the reality is that if, you know, and in my case, I'll talk about being an Asian woman. It, it's very true of other uh, women from the minority backgrounds as well. But when you're coming to the U.S. as an international student and you're a woman and you're from, uh, you know, a different background, then what you experience is really going to be um, a combination of all of those three intersecting identities. And again, I think that we've really seen that come to the fore since last year with all of the hate crimes against uh, Asian Americans in the US in which a lot of international students also got wrapped up because once they're off campus, um, they just look like a member of a certain minority group. People don't necessarily know, oh, well, they're just students who are here for a short period of time, or have they have their family been in the US for generations? People won't necessarily know that by looking at them. Um, I would say that one is sort of being aware of that, that intersectionality, because I mean, just knowing it and being aware of it also can certainly be helpful. But the other piece of it that I, felt was really important for me to sort of counteract all of those pieces was, was really finding my voice because it was a combination of, again, we talked about some of these things at the top of the conversation, Gloria, but it was a combination of um, coming from a certain culture, being a woman, being raised in a certain way where, um, 
you may not necessarily feel that you have the agency or the right to speak up in ways that you want to speak up. So I think that's the piece that really needs a lot of work. And I will say honestly that it, it has taken me years of battling again that trifecta to, to get to the point where I feel that yes, I've now found my voice and all the voices that were in my head all along, they were always there, but I can now say them and vocalize them. So I do think that that, that piece takes a lot of work. Yeah, that, that's very, very powerful because finding your voice for many is what really puts them on the road to empowerment mm -hmm. uh, you know, and transformation as well. Um, now, you've had a long career in international education, um, and I'm wondering if you have also some information on how, you know, college students or young women fresh out of college can think about getting involved in international education or in the field of diplomacy. I think there are some great organizations out there that we can look to. So the first one that comes to mind is uh, the Women's Foreign Policy Group, um, which has been very active in this space and providing events and mentoring for um, young women who are interested in um, international careers. And even though then in their name it says foreign policy, I mean, really in the mentoring they do, they bring in mentors with uh, with a range of backgrounds and where their work touches very broadly um, in, uh, on fields of international affairs and international relations. So I would say they're a really great group. Then I would say there are um, large organizations in the field, and I will put in a plug here for IIE because I know that in my years there, one of the really valuable things to me personally was that we could bring on board um, interns. There were some other fellowship programs as well as really a way to train the next generation of international education professionals. And this was certainly not by design, but a lot did were, were young women coming out of the area colleges and uh, universities in the New York area. But I would say IIE offers tremendous opportunities um, to find that sort of applied hands-on uh, experience and then other organizations like that. So those are sort of uh, the examples that come to mind immediately. Yeah, very, very good, good, good examples. And, um, you know, I, I would also suggest perhaps uh, becoming uh, connected to uh, United Nations Association, USA, that has chapters around uh, the country. That's a really great way to, you know, Get your get your toes a little bit wet about uh, international diplomacy, and they actually have a really really strong young professionals uh, component of their organization, which really focuses on bringing together young professionals uh, in the field or who are interested in the field. Um, so I'd highly recommend that as well. I just sorry to interrupt. I just thought of one more. Um, I believe their full name is the Global Leadership League. Um, and that's another one that has a lot of initiative for younger professionals in international careers, mainly women. So I think that would be another great one to, to check out. Great. Great. And anyone on the call, if you have any ideas, please feel free to drop them in the chat. That'd be really great so that, you know, we could get a more comprehensive list uh, to be able to share. Uh, I know that you've published a, a number of books and I, and I, just thought about this. Uh, did you have any any difficulties or any obstacles in publishing this current book? Uh, and and any advice giving that you could give to someone who is interested in in publishing a similar book? So yes, absolutely. Um, I would say that it was a very interesting obstacle when I first started working on this idea and started talking to what I call the gatekeepers in the publishing industry was that I often heard the message that this is not a book that can sell or that many people will want to read because eh, who's interested in international students? It's too niche. Um, it's too small an area. Um, I also tell the story about sort of uh, the, the, the title of the book, 
where my publisher and I hope she's not online, but anyway, um, she knows that she and I, and, and I love her advice, but she and I battled for long over what the title should be. And she strongly felt that, you know, having the word student in there would limit its broader appeal. So it was very interesting to me that there was, there was I, will sh I will share that there was that sense, um, and that was a challenge that, uh, is this really a topic that people are interested in? But I knew from what I, that from my lived experience and from interacting with, I mean, really, and not just sort of my interaction, but this is really the story of thousands in the US, thousands who've gone back to their home countries, that, that it was a story that needed to be told. So I would say that was the one challenge to surmount. Um, the second one was sort of my own direct challenge, which was um, really from a perspective of craft, that I wanted to tell a very personal story, but also really contextualize it and set it within a context of larger social and policy issues surrounding the value of international students and immigrants, and what would be an effective and comp compelling way to, to, to do that. Because yes, I do want the average person walking into a Barnes and Noble or you know, an average reader picking this up and saying, oh, this is a book I might want to read. So, so how do you then tell those two, um, two sides of it in a way that's appealing? Now, what we're seeing in literature, and this gets to the second part of your question, is it has begun to shift. And in recent years, we've seen many memoirs come out that are very much that blend of uh, the personal narrative, but also a very clear social message and more of a research-driven approach. So in terms of advice, I mean, I would say, um, look to examples. I would say that in really thinking about the craft and how to write the book, I must have reviewed at least 100 books um, out there to look at writing styles and how other authors were attempting this. Um, the other sort of advice I'll share, particularly for newer authors, is um, really shifting one's mindset where um, your manuscript and book is no longer your passion project. It becomes a product that you need to get into the hand of a reader. So what I mean by that is that as authors, the shift from being a writer to an author is really a shift from going from just writing to becoming a business person who understands the world of book marketing and book publicity and everything that surrounds the publishing industry. So that would be sort of my, my one piece of advice, which may sound like a lot of work, but that's the reality of publishing today. Very, very good advice. I think it's a question, an important question and, an, and a really good answer because it's an area that a lot of people probably don't know a lot about. You know, it's not like you just you just write this book and then everything just moves along smoothly, that it is a process and that along the road, you know, you have to utilize not only the skills that you have, but you have to pick up some new ones along the way. So that's really important. Um, I, I don't think uh, the conversation would be complete, obviously, without mentioning the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we have seen from our own current international fellows and the fellows from last fellows and grantees from last year what a challenge it has been trying to pursue their you know their educational aspirations during the pandemic and we we've managed to now uh, field two classes of AEW fellows and grantees during the the pandemic but it's been really really tough um, and I and I certainly applaud all of them in the way in which they have uh, succeeded in, in many ways, despite um, all of the challenges. And that includes not only our international students, but our uh, U.S. students as well. And so given, given the pandemic um, and the emphasis on online and virtual education, um, what are your thoughts around it becoming sort of the norm in the United States um, in education globally? I think it'll be the norm in that it's going to that that it'll be the norm for virtual approaches to coexist with in-person approaches, but it will not be the norm for it to completely replace the in-person experience. 
So what I mean by that is that there is going to be a revival, and we're already seeing that. Um, you know, even if we look just at international students, they're coming back this fall. Um, consulates are slowly opening up, issuing visas around the world, and that 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 pent up demand for mobility on the part of students and professionals is slowly returning. However, um, I think up until this time, um, uh, until the time of COVID, at least for the higher ed sector, maybe the nonprofit sector as well, um, technology was all, it, it was something to be dealt with and to be put up with, but it was really not tackled in an intentional and serious way. And I think that's what's changed where organizations and institutions have realized that this can no longer be an afterthought. In fact, it needs to be central to our programming as a critical complement to, to other offerings. And I think that's what's changed, which means, which means that virtual programs um, are going to help reach more diverse populations who cannot and may not want to travel going to reach more non-traditional learners, again, who may not want to leave their home country or their home context to go somewhere for, you know, a two or three year experience, um, which means that they have to be designed in really intentional ways. So I think it's opening a door to opportunities, but it's going to coexist with in-person opportunities, not, not replace those or take those over completely. Great. Um, so we do have a few question, additional questions that have come in, and I'm wondering if uh, if you agree, if we could address a few of them. Sure, absolutely. All righty, let's see. Uh, okay, how about this? Can you talk more concretely about gender norms in India versus the U.S.? Um. So that's a that's an interesting one, but I, I think um, so. Before I say anything, I do want to acknowledge that my intent here is not to sort of cast India in the light of oh, this is sort of this dark, benighted society, and here I was coming from there, gaining all this freedom. That that's not that's not the point because if you look at contemporary India. Um, like any other society, it's a country and society of contrasts where it may still have one of the lowest female literacy rates in the world, but it also had more political leaders um, uh, in its government well before the US did. It's all, also had a woman president already and that story is, is uh, a prime minister and that story is well known. So again, it's a society of contrasts like any other society. Having said that, um, I will say that some of the differences are um, around, I mean, what I would put it down to is sort of, and then it manifests in more detailed ways, but the extent to which women make independent decisions about their lives and their futures, again, um, starting right from, if you're a young woman, um, do you get to leave home and go to university in another part of the country, let alone go abroad, whereas your brothers might be able to? Um, let me also acknowledge that there is a real issue, uh, particularly in certain parts of India, with um, sexual violence, which severely constrains the mobility of women. So that is something to be contended with, that, that in order to be safe and their own safety, girls and women need to curtail their movement in certain ways. Um, from that point on, sort of certainly, you know, to some extent, the arranged marriage system still exists in India, even though many people are choosing their own uh, life partners. So again, within that arranged marriage context, how much of a voice and agency do women have? And then, you know, there are the other examples to draw upon. But again, what I want to leave us with is it's not so much, oh, here's this 
you know, again, uh, uh, any sort of backward country. And then here's this very liberal society, because some of those elements we also see in American society. And I draw that out my in my book as well, that, you know, uh, what was shocking to me when I came to the U.S. was I was thinking, oh, here's this Western, you know, Western country, much more progressive, much more liberal. But it came as a shock to me that there's a gender wage gap. And as AAUW's own excellent continuing work on this issue has documented, it's galling to me that that wage gap still exists in a country like the U.S., um, how difficult it's been to get women elected to positions of power, how many women are actually sitting in boardrooms making decisions. So I point this out to say that some of these issues, and certainly going back to sexual violence as well, we've seen that in the past few years with the, uh, you know, the Me Too movement, et cetera, where that's been laid to bear in the US. So I think at some level, these are universal issues and they manifest themselves differently in different societies. I know it's always a little bit of a walking of a tightrope sometime, tightrope when you're trying to, you know, answer some of these questions, you know, and, and also so that people understand that everything has context and putting it within the context of the culture and society, which is really, really important. Uh, so I, I want to thank you for having this conversation with me and all of our guests on our Zoom this afternoon. Thank you for, you know, really sharing your book and your, your important insight on the topics that we have discussed and obviously uh, sharing your, your time with us. I really, really appreciate it. As you can see, we have Dr. Uh, Bandari's website up, so please do check it out. Uh, I hope that all of you will take a look at uh, the resources she has there and buy her book. That's really important. As I mentioned up front, the AAUW website will have a place where you can check out the conversation uh, that has been recorded. It should be up in about in about uh, five to seven business days, so uh, be on the lookout for that. I'd like to thank my colleague, Milan Anderson, for uh, helping out and organize, helping to organize this webinar today uh, and to be being our tech guru in, in the background, so thank you for your support. Please do, everyone, visit AUW.org and learn more about our upcoming professional development opportunities uh, through our about our educational programs, our fellowships. Uh, we certainly love for you, obviously, to contribute to AUW so we can keep bringing great programs like the one today. Uh, we will be uh, surveying you. We always like to know what kinds of topics that you're interested in so that we can bring them to you for your um, learning and enjoyment. As always, I tell everyone to please wear a mask and stay safe. And I want to give Rajika the last word to our audience. Well, thank you for that, Gloria. Well, um, I guess I'll just uh, first off thank everyone because I was sharing with Gloria right before that it is so hard to get people to virtual events these days. So all of you who showed up, I'm very, very grateful that you actually <laughs> made time to be with us in real time. So deeply grateful for that. And I guess I would just say that I'm so grateful to AAUW. We, we need more organizations um, like this because at the end of the day, um, all of the work in its different shapes and forms is really about helping women find their voice. And so I'm, I'm very grateful for the work that you all do and, and um, how you made my journey possible and really just deeply um, grateful to have had this opportunity today. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us, and we really appreciate you being with us. Uh, everyone, please enjoy the rest of your day or your evening, depending on your time zone. Thank you so much, and thanks again, Dr. Bandari. Thank you.